It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and uh, again, congratulations to the uh, five uh, new members uh, joining the Assembly today, uh, the families that have joined with us uh, as well. It's time, Christine, Elisa, I know Norm and Steve went through it. Very exciting to actually walk in here to the Assembly and take your place. So congratulations to all those members and their families here today. <laughs> Speaker, a quick question to the Premier. Uh, Premier, almost a million people today um, are jobless. And instead of using the summer to bring forward any agenda around jobs, we saw the Liberals continue with the attempt to bury information around the gas plant scandal, including allegations Order. of intimidation of the Speaker to keep documents outside of public view. I've come to a conclusion, Premier, I hope you have as well, that the only way to get answers for taxpayers Question. is a full judicial inquiry into the gas plant scandal. Would you agree in support one today? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I will, I'm going to answer your question, but I, uh, I want to just say, first of all, thank you to uh, the five new members for introducing a moment of harmony into the legislature <laughs> and to welcome them to, uh, to this august place. I look forward to working with all of you. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, I just want to remind the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition that, in fact, the August net job numbers were up 43,600 in Ontario. The jobs were up 59,000, Mr. Speaker. So, in fact, the bulk of the net new jobs in the country were here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of that, and, Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything in our power to keep that to keep that uh, trend in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> I, uh, I can't believe, Speaker, the, the Premier calls that a turnaround. I call that a miserable failure when a million people today have no job to go to, that want to make ends meet for their families. And that's why we brought a plan for it to actually get our economy to move again, to create jobs and to hold this government to account for its waste of taxpayers' money. Not a single jobs item on the agenda here today. Here's what's troublesome. Instead of working on jobs in the economy, you continue to try to bury information around the gas plan scandal, yep. including allegations of an attempt to intimidate the Speaker of the Assembly, an attempt by Liberal staffers to put the Speaker, and I quote, on notice to keep documents out of scrutiny for the public. Surely people have been fired. Surely you've taken this cause up. What can you tell us, Premier, Question. about this attempt to intimidate the Speaker to bury gas plan files? So, Mr. Speaker, let me, let me talk about what we've been doing this summer in terms of uh, traveling the province and making investments, Mr. Speaker. So $17.6 million, Mr. Speaker, we put in place to support business and regions across the province. That has leveraged, Mr. Speaker, over $133 million in investments, and it's helped to create nearly 2,800 jobs, Mr. Speaker. We launched our youth job strategy, Mr. Speaker. As the Leader of the Opposition well knows, $295 million we're going to be investing, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that young people have the opportunity to have placements and to have co-op programs and to start jobs, Mr. Speaker. Part of that fund is an entrepreneurship fund, Mr. Speaker. We've launched that. We have, we're increasing the employer uh, health tax exemption, Mr. Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition should know yes, that it's going to help small business and allow them to hire more people. That's job creation. Strategy, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I do want to offer the uh, leader uh, of, of the opposition a small caution, and that is uh, there is an issue before this house under a privileged request uh, for my investigation. So I would ask him to stay away from that particular topic while I uh, deal with that issue before it's live in the house right now. So I'd uh, defer to him. Well, Speaker. Uh, the fact that there's a point of privilege motion of this seriousness shows something has gone dramatically off the rails when it comes to Liberal government. And Premier, respectfully, you said you'd be different. You've now been Premier for almost nine months, and eight months, and you've, you've failed to act. And in fact, the cover-up continues to happen. Uh, this is not a time for hand-holding. It's not a time for kicking it down the road. It is time for action. It is time for judicial inquiry. It is time for the truth, and it is time to expose those who tried to intimidate the Speaker of the Assembly. Premier, don't you agree? What action will you take, and will you call a full judicial inquiry? Premier. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thought that the uh, leader of the opposition was talking about a job strategy, and that was the that was the answer I was giving, Mr. Speaker, because I think that is what people in the province are focused on, and they want to know that those 43,600 net new jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, are a result of work that we've been doing for the last eight months. And, Mr. Speaker, I. It's quite clear that government works to put the conditions in place so that the private sector can create those jobs, Mr. Speaker, and that's the work that we've been doing. On the issue of the relocation of the gas plants, which is the fixation, Mr. Speaker, across the aisle, what I have said and what we have done since I came into office as the Premier is we have opened up the process. We have made it clear, Mr. Speaker, that as questions are asked, they will be answered. We've provided thousands of pages of documents. We will continue to provide the answers to the questions that are asked, Mr. Speaker. Question. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the um, Premier. Uh, Premier, you recall on, on March 6 of last year, the Ontario PC Caucus brought forward a motion to build subways in the City of Toronto, and specifically in that motion, subways to Scarborough. We simply believe that world-class cities build underground. They build subways, and it's time to treat Scarborough residents as full-class citizens in Toronto. Speaker. Order. Leader. So last year you voted against the subway for Scarborough. You were against subways for Scarborough. You're pro LRT. During the election campaign, you flip flopped, and quite frankly, your Minister of Transportation has been a runaway train when it comes to making announcements that make no sense whatsoever. So, Premier, why did you say one thing during a by election, one thing last year, and something completely different after the by election? Why should we trust a word you or your Transportation Minister has to say? Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker. There is a uh, there's an old teacher trick that uh, was used many years ago and probably is till today, where uh, oh that could be arranged, <laughs> where the person starts off real tough at the beginning and then eases off instead of waiting to get tough at the end. Just thought I would offer you that uh, experience that I've had. That goes for everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, what is clear, Mr. Speaker, is that it's this government that is committed to building transit. Since the day we came into office, Mr. Speaker, we've been investing in transit, and we will continue to do that. The newfound interest on the opposite side of the House for transit investment is heartening, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to working with the opposition on moving forward to build transit. I am the first to admit, Mr. Speaker, that the subway, the transit in Scarborough has been an issue of contention. I was Minister of Transportation when there was a serious debate about what, what modality was going to be built in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, and that has gone back and forth. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that Answer. we need to work with the people of Scarborough, we need to work with the City Council, Mr. Speaker, and where we have landed is a subway in Scarborough, Mr. Thank Speaker. The member from the South Carolina. Uh, Mr. Speaker, before I begin, I would like to thank all the members for their very uh, warm reception this morning, and I look forward to meeting you all personally. Here, here, here. Mr. Speaker, my question is, is for the uh, Premier. Madam Premier, uh, prior to the by-election, you promised the people of Scarborough that you would put out $1.8 billion for public transit in Scarborough. Unfortunately, uh, after that, you've now made another promise that you're going to put only $1.4 billion forward, and we're going to have fewer stops. And I would like to know why you, you don't think enough of the people of Scarborough, and for that matter, the people of Ontario, to put the full amount in and give these people the subway they deserve. Thank you. Premier, 
Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore to the Legislature. And just to clarify, Mr. Speaker, we committed $1.4 billion to the construction of this project, Mr. Speaker, and we also committed $320 million for improvements to the Kennedy Station. So we are following through on our commitment. And I think what is critical to understand, Mr. Speaker, is that since 2003, since we came into office, we have been investing in transit really across the the province, Mr. Speaker, because the GTHA is obviously an important focal point, but we move the gas tax out, Mr. Speaker. There is gas tax that's being invested in transit across this province. We have been consistent in our support for transit and consistent in our call for a revenue stream that will allow us to build transit going forward. I hope that with the newfound passion for transit that the opposition party will work with us as we work to implement that plan, Mr. Speaker, and find that revenue stream so we can continue to build transit across the GTHA. Thank you. Supplementary. Final supplementary. Premier, the people of Toronto deserve a better answer than that. Yes. I think your party knew so well that you would break your promise to the people of Scarborough. You say transit's a priority, but your only priority is keeping your faltering government alive. Faced with the risk of losing a Liberal riding, you dreamt up a plan you had no intention of paying for. Premier, will you admit that this was no more than a scheme to try to save a seat in Scarborough? Thank you. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that I know the history of this conversation pretty well because I was Minister of Transportation starting in 2010. We have been committed to building transit in Scarborough since that time and before, Mr. Speaker. We remain committed to building transit. It has been a contentious file. There is no doubt about that. But the fact is that we have worked with the people of Scarborough, we have worked with the City Council, and there has been a lot of back and forth. And the member opposite is newly from City Council, and he knows he knows how contentious that debate has been. And it must be difficult for him to actually ask that question with a straight face. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased that we will continue to honour our commitment to build transit in Scarborough, and that is that. Thank you. Member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. The member from Peterborough, come to order. New question. The, member, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I also want to begin by congratulating the five new members who took their seats this morning and uh, share with uh, all of their friends and relatives who are either here or watching the excitement that they have and the pride that they have in those people. Uh, congratulations to everyone. Now, Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Over the summer, all of us had an opportunity to hear from Ontarians, both on the campaign trail and off, and they told us pretty clearly that they're worried about keeping good jobs, ensuring health care is there for them when they need it, and keeping up with the bills in tough times. More importantly, they are tired of hearing promises of change and seeing the same old status quo. Has the Premier got the message that people need to see results? Question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I absolutely uh, concur with the leader of the third party that what we need to be doing is making investments in people, making investments in infrastructure, and supporting business so that they can create jobs. Which, Mr. Speaker, is why I am very pleased that in August the jobs numbers were up 43,000 in 43,600 in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It's why I'm so pleased that we've been able to commit 17.6 million dollars to support business and regional economy. Mr. Speaker, that we have launched the, the youth uh, job strategy that I know the member of the third, the leader of the third party, is very keen on. Mr. Speaker, that we're in, that we're dealing with the employer employer health tax exemption, Mr. Speaker, which will allow employers to hire more people. Those are real changes, Mr. Speaker. Those are the kinds of things that are getting results already. Answer. Mr. Thank you. New question. Uh, supplementary. Well, Speaker, Sorry. I would put to the Premier that part-time service sector jobs are nothing to crow about these days yeah, in Ontario. Exactly. 
The measures that we put on the agenda in the spring will ensure that seniors are not left waiting for home care, that young people get the good jobs that they need, and that all of us have real accountability on government spending. But we have a lot of work to do if this is going to be anything other than more promises from a Liberal government desperate to hold on to power. For example, Ontario's wealthiest corporations will be getting a brand new HST loophole on meals and entertainment pretty soon. Now, last spring, the government said that they wanted this loophole closed. Have they done anything about it, Speaker? No. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think the leader of the third party knows that this is not a loophole, Mr. Speaker. And we've talked about this many times in the legislature. The Minister of Finance has written to the federal finance minister to uh, to work to rationalize this, Mr. Speaker. And and I think the I think the leader of the third party knows, Mr. Speaker, that what we are doing here on this side of the house, and in fact with the with the help of uh, of her party in, in getting the budget passed, is making those investments supporting business so that those businesses can create the jobs that are needed in the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, what I do know is that people are tired of the same old status quo that they've seen for the past 10 years coming from the Liberal government. They told us very clearly that they want to see results that make their lives better this session. And we're going to be working hard to deliver those results, Speaker. For example, drivers paying the highest auto insurance rates in the country are wondering how long they're going to have to wait for their rates to actually come down. They see the government working overtime to protect insurance industry profits, but moving as slow as possible when it comes to lowering their auto insurance rates. Can the Premier explain why it is that the government's dragging their feet on lowering the rates while it continues to protect industry? Profit margins. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the leader of the third party asked a number of questions and uh, touched on a number of issues in her question. And I know that uh, that there are ministers who will want to speak specifically to some of those issues. But I just want to make this point, and that is that I am determined to continue to work to make the minority parliament function, Mr. Speaker, so that we can get results, so that we can make the changes that need to be changed, so that, that we can bring the legislation in that needs to be passed, Mr. Speaker. And so I look forward to working with the leader of the third party on issues like auto insurance, on which we're not dragging our feet, Mr. Speaker, but in fact we're implementing the changes that will allow those average increases to be uh, in, in decreases to happen, Mr. Speaker, and that we are working, we look forward to working with the third party on making sure that those Investments in home care happen, Mr. Speaker. We're, we look forward to working with the third party and with the opposition on the changes Answer. to, and for example, the employer health tax exemption so that businesses will have more room to hire people. That's the work of the legislature. I look forward to working with the opposition members on that, Mr. Speaker. New question. We are the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. You know, I really look forward to change, and people keep hearing promises of change, but over the summer they saw more and more of the same old, same old from the Liberal government. Way back in January, New Democrats proposed a public inquiry to look into the gas plant scandal, but the Premier insisted that a legislative committee would do a better job. This morning, she actually insisted again that all the answers were going to be gotten by that committee. She insisted it would have a full scope to ensure that all questions were answered back in January as well, Speaker. Can the Premier explain why, then, the committee chair, the Liberal MPP from Etobicoke North, is blocking questions at committee? Yes, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the leader of the third party knows that that is not what is happening and that the, the chair of committees take their advice from the clerks, Mr. Speaker, and they act in accordance with that advice. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, Ontarians judge leaders by what they do, not just what they say. They see New Democrats have been delivering results that will make government more accountable, and they see Liberals trying to stop Ontarians from getting answers about the gas plants. Now, on August the 13th, the Premier said she was surprised that MPPs weren't being allowed to ask about senior Liberal staff. Will the Premier? Will the Premier? direct her government house leader to agree to expand the mandate of the Justice Committee so that Ontarians can get answers about attempts by senior Liberals to influence the Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the House leader 
is going to want to uh, comment on uh, on this question in this, the next supplementary. But let me just say, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased that we were able to get the budget passed in this legislature. I'm very pleased that the NDP were able to support the Liberal budget, Mr. Speaker. That the NDP were able to support the initiatives of this government to invest in home care, Mr. Speaker, to invest in a youth job strategy, to invest in transit, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased that the the third party was able to see that the people of this province sent a minority government to Queen's Park and that they are working with us, have been working with us to make that work. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please? You see it, please? Order, please. I do want to offer uh, the, the leader of the third party the same uh, 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 same advice that I offered the leader of the uh, uh, official opposition, and that is to there's a live issue before this house right now in dealing with the uh, prima facie case uh, regarding the issue you brought up. So I'm asking that you uh, refrain from asking questions about that particular issue, and it's just uh, just offering it as a uh, caution, please. Uh, final supplementary. Speaker, this is about her leadership, not the leash that she has her House leader on. That's right. On August the 13th, the Premier said, I was surprised that the questions were out of order. I fully expected those questions. Stop the order. 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 The member from Renfrew come to order. I, uh, I'm not impressed. Please put your question. On August the 13th, the Premier said, I was surprised that the questions were out of order. I fully expected those questions could be asked. The Premier herself has promised that all questions would be answered. Now She can keep her word and do the right thing now, or she can continue to protect well-connected Liberal insiders. Will the Premier do the right thing, Speaker, and get Ontarians answers, or will she let the same old status quo stand? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, thank you. It is day one. <laughs> just noting. Um, I, I, I just want to note, Mr. Speaker, that the the quote that the leader of the third party has read out a couple of times that I was surprised demonstrates, Mr. Speaker, that I don't control what goes on in committee. Exactly. And so when, exactly. when something happens, Mr. Speaker, and I'm asked a question, I respond honestly to the question. So we all want the information out, Mr. Speaker. We want to, we want to continue to be open. We've, I wrote to the, uh, the Auditor General. I asked that the Auditor General look at both situations. Mr. Speaker, there are 135,000 documents that have been provided to the committee. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party knows this. I really believe she knows that it is my intention. It is our. It has been our intention all along to make sure that as questions are asked, that they get answered, and we will Sir? continue in that manner. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Simcoe Great. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is uh, also for the Premier. Premier, over the summer, my colleagues uh, and NDP colleagues were prevented at the Justice Committee from asking very important and pertinent questions about your Liberal operatives, senior Liberal staffers, attempting to strong-arm the Speaker after his decision in finding a prima facie case of contempt against your government in the gas plant scandal. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to know why you weren't forthcoming with that information that the meeting had took place and put the Speaker in such a terrible position. Secondly, so no transparency. You said you're going to be transparent, but you're not. Secondly, why did we have to find out by scouring through thousands and thousands of secret emails that the meeting did take place between the Speaker and senior staffers? And thirdly, what have you done to take, to take action to make sure that your senior staff people, that Liberal campaign people, will be prevented in the future, and this will never Question. happen again, from inserting politics and trying to influence rulings of an impartial speaker. 
activities. Again, I, I'm very much uh, wanting quiet so I can ask a, make a statement. Um, I'm, very, I'm very concerned about uh, the direction when there's a live issue that is being dealt with, uh, that will be dealt with, and uh, I am sensitive to the questioning. So I'm trying to be as balanced as possible with this, but I'm asking all members that are asking those kinds of questions to try to divert yourself from make, make, make mention of the, of the chair while the chair is supposed to be making a ruling. So if you can find a way to do that and uh, everyone would be listening while I'm speaking would be helpful. Uh, so I'm, I'm leaving it with you to try to make that happen. Uh, and if not, then I will rule it out of order. Uh, Premier, you can answer. Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, no, Mr. Mr. Speaker it's, it's unfortunate that members of the opposition, including the member who just asked the question, are, are really uh, playing some procedural games here. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the Speaker of the Committee made a ruling, the and there were another the of options that uh, going forward we could deal with. One and was a point of privilege, court. which the honourable member in question has given notice to this House, and this House is seized with. The second is for the House leaders to sit down and talk about a way, reasonable way to move forward. Mr. Speaker, the House leaders have met on this matter, and without divulging what are confidential conversations, I can say that we looked at both. I, as House leader, would never want to be in a position of trying to horse trade away the right of a member to raise a point of privilege. We talked about some potential ways forward, but the honourable member has chosen to raise that point of privilege. That is his right, Mr. Speaker, but then he cannot not use question period to try to berate the government, Mr. Order. Speaker. He's got to choose a choice procedurally, and these Answer. types of games are, quite frankly, beneath him. Thank you. Supplementary. Supplementary. I'm allowing it. I'm still stunned with that answer, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, all right, back to the Premier. Uh, Premier, uh, Ontarians are, are disgusted with what happened. And, uh, you know, uh, it took Watergate a long time to be uh, a big issue. This, in parliamentary circles, is a huge issue. You do not do what your people attempted to do. It's not whether the Speaker was influenced or not. It's the attempt to strong-arm the Speaker while a ruling was going on. Uh, the email exchanges between these Liberal staffers and, and advisers have raised a lot of eyebrows with members of this House and with the public. You want to be open, you want to be transparent. The people of Ontario want you to be open and transparent, and they want the answers. You won't, you won't, because the House Leader hasn't brought forward a motion that we could all agree on to expand the mandate of the Justice Committee so that we could ask these process uh, questions leading up to the Speaker's ruling. Um, so, uh, at the end of the day, I ask you, uh, what are you going to do to correct things? And secondly, has anyone been fired over this? Question. Again, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's, it really is beneath this member. He knows that with a point of privilege before this House that we could not explore any other way forward. I was not in a position to ever want to horse trade away the right of a member to raise a point of privilege. I did, without breaking the uh, confidentiality of House leaders, I did offer a potential way to move forward, and Mr. Speaker, we know uh, by the actions of the member that that was rejected. The fact of the matter, Mr. Speaker, is the chair of the committee made a ruling ba based on his best advice. I understand later, later in the session, Mr. Speaker, a uh, technical briefing was offered by the chair and uh, the clerk and other experts. And you know what I found surprising, Mr. Speaker? The opposition tried to have it in camera, in secret, oh! Mr. Speaker, so that the press and the public could not realize that this was a ruling that was based upon the legal advice that, that uh, was received by the chair of the committee at the time. Mr. Speaker, we will hear the point of privilege, and you, sir, will deal with it. Thank you. New question. The member from the member from London West. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. On Friday, people in London West received some discouraging news with the release of the latest job numbers. Compared to a year ago, there are 5,800 fewer people in the London labour market. Sure. That's people who have given up all hope of finding work and have just stopped looking. 
Premier, taking away people's hope that they will ever be able to earn a living is no solution to high unemployment rates. When is the government going to take real action to create jobs in London West? Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, of course, we are working hard to create jobs right across this province. In fact, I was in the London area just last week making some announcements with the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. I was important announcements in uh, in, pla in in places like Palmerston and in Guelph, in Elmira, and I'm working closely with actually with the leaders of London, the leadership of London. And it's important to recognize that although there are provincial disparities in terms of job numbers that we saw in August. As the Premier mentioned, overall 43,000 new jobs created. And let's drill down a little bit in that and what that means, because we actually saw, some are asking about the quality of those jobs. We actually saw that there were 7,600 7, new manufacturing jobs created in August alone. There were an additional, there were an additional 13,300 yes, jobs sir. created among our youth. We have an important youth job strategy that's contributing to that, and I'll speak more about the measures that we're taking in the supplementary. supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that London has lost 4,600 jobs compared to a year ago, and people in London West are worried about being able to pay the bills. The Southwestern Ontario Development Fund was established to help businesses create jobs, yet the only thing Londoners got from the fund recently was a by-election re-announcement of 14 jobs that had already been announced earlier. Again, my question is to the Premier. When can the people of London West expect to see the fund bring some desperately needed new jobs into the London economy? Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, I look forward to applications coming from London and the London area, as we've already seen. Arbo Tools is another example, just so in a riding immediately adjacent, but there are a number of people from London that work at that firm. We provided them with a support a grant through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. In fact, even though this fund has only existed since October, and I know it's a fund that the PC government, rather the PC opposition, uh, uh, PC opposition voted against. But since October alone, actually, this government has invested more than $25 million in southwestern Ontario through this fund. That's more than 6,000 jobs that have been created and retained through this program. It's leveraged more than $200 million from the private sector. I've had a great time all summer traveling through southwestern Ontario, including London, seeing the projects, the programs that, are, that, are, that we're contributing to. And Manufacturing sir. is alive and well, and we're working with these companies as they expand and they extend their global reach. New question from Scarborough Guildwood. today to rise in this House on behalf of the people of Scarborough Guildwood. My question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. <laughs> Speaker, my constituents rely on public transit every day to get to work and from school. Improving transit is a top priority for my constituents. People in my riding across Scarborough are looking for more frequent and faster options when using public transit to get around, and they want to know who will deliver. My colleagues and members from Scarborough, Scarborough Southwest, Scarborough Agent Court, Pickering, Scarborough East, Scarborough Rouge River, and Scarborough Centre have been tireless champions for a subway in Scarborough. Premier Wynne. Question. Premier Wynne and this government have stepped up to the plate with a plan to build a subway to Scarborough and the money to back it up. However, there seems to be the risk of more delay because other levels of governments don't seem to be ready to support a Sar Scarborough subway extension. Speaker, Thank we need you. to get Scarborough moving. Will the minister tell this House when will a subway project get underway in Scarborough? Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would first like to uh, join my colleagues in the House to welcoming fine, very fine Ontarians to this legislature. This is a huge privilege, and congratulations uh, to you and your families, and also to the other candidates that weren't successful. So, congratulations to all of you. Um, 
We are building a subway, Mr. Speaker. It's the first thing I'd like to say. I think this government is tired of the talk. We've had, if we've had anything about Scarborough and subways, we've had debates, and we haven't had enough action. And Premier Wynne has asked that I make sure this project gets built on budget and on time. We have, we have allocated, actually, Mr. Speaker, the budget is the total budget for this is actually more like 1.8 because we have 320 million in the common components in the project. We will be building, Mr. Speaker, uh, without any ask for funds from the federal or provincial government, Answer. a $1.4 billion subway to the Scarborough Town Centre, Mr. Speaker, on budget, on time. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, thank you to the Minister for that update. I'm proud that this government continues to make public transit a priority. Ontario Liberals are transit builders. The projects being funded under the big move in Scarborough will be well received by the people of Scarborough Guildwood. The investments that this government is making will help make public transit a better choice for commuters, reduce congestion on our roads, and contribute to a better quality of life for Ontario families. Speaker, when my constituents talk with me about improving transit, they want to know how it's going to be done as much as they want to know what's going to be done. However, many are unfamiliar with the big move and Metrolinx itself, the agency responsible for implementing transit in the GTHA. Speaker, will the minister tell this House what Metro Metrolinx is doing to deliver on the promise of better transit for the people of Scarborough and throughout the GTHA? Thank you. Minister. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member again and for her advocacy for her constituents. We are building $16.4 billion in a, the largest regional build-out of transit in the history of the GTHA, 15 major projects and a major new system, Mr. Speaker. And 90 per cent of that is being funded singularly by the provincial government, which is where lies the challenge. Mr. Speaker, 4 per cent of the funding comes from the federal government, a measly 4 per cent. In the six months, Mr. Speaker, that I've been the minister, I have written letters. I have had one conversation with Minister LaBelle early on. I've invited him on a cycling trip with him. Uh, we have had nothing. Minister Raitt took over a couple of months ago. Uh, I have tried to get a meeting with her to talk about this for several weeks, for a couple of months. Yes, we actually had, Mr. Speaker, three different appointments in the last few weeks. She cancelled all of them. We have no support from the federal government. We have no meetings, and they clearly don't care about this at all, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Never mind, fund it. Thank you. A new question. The member from Nipissing. Yes, speaker, my question this morning is for the uh, Premier. Welcome back, Premier. The Liberal gas plant scandal hearings went on all summer long. The surprising thing here, we are almost a year after the first email documents started dribbling out, and we still don't know how much the Oakville gas plant cancellation was. We have one fact confirmed by the documents and by sworn testimony. And, Premier, that is as you, as Cabinet Chair, signed the order that started this whole charade with TransCanada. Now, you either knew how much this was going to cost Ontario, or you blindly signed it with no regard whatsoever to what this will do to the taxpayers or the hydro bills. So, Premier, when you put that pen in your hand to start this whole thing off, were you thinking, I don't know or I don't care? Speaker, we talk about transparency. This is the premier. This is the premier of the province who has asked the auditor general to look That's into the Oakville ride. situation, and I see from media reports that she is suggesting that I'll be out in the coming days. She said early fall, Mr. Speaker. It was this premier who went forward and. Uh, asked for a broadening of the committee. She even offered a select committee, which the opposition rejected. Seat. It was this premier who went in front of the committee and answered questions, hundreds of questions that have been put for, uh, to her, both in the House and in committee. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk a little bit about transparency in that particular member. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, he was mayor of North Bay for a number of years, actually, I think eight, nine, ten years. And the Liberal Research Bureau, Mr. Speaker, asked for emails under Freedom of information from his time in mayor. As mayor and Mr. Speaker, I look forward to sharing the response in, my, in the supplementary. Uh, supplementary. 
Thank you again to the Premier. You know, it is pitiful, Speaker, that uh, I can guarantee you in those emails there were no gas plant scandal uh, documents. And I can also tell you I have no idea what the city did with my eight years of e seven years of emails that I saved uh, when I was in the office. Your Liberal operatives, Premier, would not tell us the truth during the scandal hearings this summer. Anyone watching that saw the pathetic display your party put on with half-truths and misdirection, such as we've just seen from the, the House Leader. Nobody would tell us how much you, Premier, spent to cancel the Oakville plant, but we know you already know that number. You already have the Auditor General's findings, and you know you've been caught red-handed again. You spoke of the people's fixation with gas plants. Well, let me tell you, Premier, they are fixated. They're fed up. They're fed up with your nonsense, your deleted emails, and your delay tactics. Tell us today how much of our taxpayer and ratepayers' money did you spend to cancel the Oakville gas plant? Tell us right now. You know, you know what, Mr. Speaker? We don't know whether there were any emails about gas plants in the honourable member's emails because this is what we heard from the deputy clerk for the town of North Bay. I quote, I have now, you'll want to hear this, I have now confirmed with the director of information systems and the executive assistant for the mayor, wait for it, wait for it, that all available emails and attachments for the mayor and his office staff from December, December 1, 2003 to November 30, 2010 are no longer available. Emails, emails are only kept. Mr. Speaker, emails are only kept for a 30-day period. So you know, Mr. Speaker, the dramatic Minister of Energy, come to order. Minister of the Environment, come to order. Mr. Speaker, the point is that the Stay dramatics in the histrionics, let's let the committee do its work. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that they have heard from dozens and dozens of witnesses. They have looked for over 100,000 documents. They got to do. Let's let them do it. New question? The member from Windsor to come seat. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to everyone for that warm welcome this morning. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. In late 2012, the minister responsible for infrastructure learned that the girders manufactured for the Herb Gray Parkway in Windsor did not meet code. Nevertheless, some of those girders were installed as late as January, and it was only this July that the ministry ordered a stop to the installation of girders on this vital $1.4 billion project. Speaker, why did this government wait until July to stop construction when it knew months earlier about the structurally unsound girders? Mr. Speaker, um, this government uh, is pretty proud of a $1.4 billion investment that we're making in the Windsor-Essex Parkway, the right the road. This is timely because the bridge crossing uh, of this unprecedented level of infrastructure is of huge concern to this government, and we know it is the foundation for future economic development, Mr. Speaker, in the Windsor-Essex area. And Soon as, Mr. Speaker, we discovered, I discovered that there was an issue, we acted immediately. Uh, I have now ordered an inquiry. Uh, the expert review panel uh, is reviewing this entire matter, Mr. Speaker. We acted promptly. That is an open and transparent process. They will be rising and reporting within the next 30 days, Mr. Speaker, and I think all of the questions being raised will be answered, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you very much. 
Speaker, the government has retained a group of what it calls leading experts in structural engineering to review these unsound girders. The study was to be completed in late summer. Now we learn that the deadline for submissions has been extended to the end of September, meaning an, even an interim report won't be available until sometime this winter. When will this legislature, when will the people of Windsor, Tecumseh and LaSalle finally get some answers on this critical project? Yes. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I became aware of this, as you know, in May. I immediately acted, gathered information, and went to my deputy. We immediately, in June, ordered the, uh, we, the, to cease any construction. We will not open any part of the parkway until this review is complete, and we've committed to that, Mr. Speaker. We're managing this in a prudent and thoughtful way. The expert panel are the engineers who will make these determinations around compliance and around structural integrity. This is not something for politicians. When you, the transcripts will all be public, uh, the committee will be reporting completely publicly, and all these questions will, uh, will, be seen, uh, will be seen in the full report, Mr. Speaker. I think it will demonstrate that certainly I, as a minister, and this Answer. government responded quickly and promptly as we came across information that caused Thank concern, you. Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to echo the comments uh, of the member from Etobicoke, Etobicoke Lakeshore uh, and thank everyone for their warm welcome in the house in the ledge today. Uh, I understand it's not that way every day. <laughs> At least that's what I've been told. I'd also like to say it's an honour to rise today on behalf of the residents of Ottawa South. And my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. As our population ages, the quality and sustainability of health care is a growing concern for my constituents. Whether it's a trip to the emergency room or a visit to the family doctor, they want to know health care services will be there for them when they need them. I have made clear my commitment to ensure the people of Ottawa South get the high quality of care they deserve. Question. Could the minister speak about what we're doing to keep Ottawa healthy? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, I uh, am very sincere in my congratulations to the new member from Ottawa South and to other, the other new members who have been elected to this wonderful legislature. Congratulations to you all. We are making important investments uh, to improve the quality of care in Ottawa and accessibility to health care in the Ottawa area. Ten family health teams have now been established and are providing care to 140,000 people in the Ottawa area. As the member from Ottawa Orleans knows well, we are, uh, we're committed to building a family health hub in Orleans to provide prime, uh, comprehensive primary care in Orleans. We've cut wait times in Ottawa. For example, MRI wait times at the Ottawa Hospital have been reduced by 82%. And here, anyone here. needing a hip replacement at, at Montfort has had their weight cut in half. Speaker, the previous there government you. wanted to shut down Montfort Hospital. Our government has invested $173 million in expanding and redeveloping Montfort. And just this past summer, it was certified as an academic teaching hospital. Things are getting Thank better you. in Ottawa. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister for Health and Long-Term Care has given me a very good answer. I want to make sure that my French-speaking constituent um, are well served. The Montfort Hospital is very essential for them. They had offer very good um, health services, and it's a hospital that is very important for the French speakers in this constituency. Could the Minister of Health tell me more about what the government is doing for Ottawa Francophones? And also, could she tell me what's been done to uh, improve the Montfort Hospital? To the, uh, uh, to the Minister of uh, uh, Responsible for Francophone Affairs. Minister Responsible for Francophone Affairs. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would also like to uh, congratulate John Fraser for his uh, uh, election. He is uh, an extraordinary man. He uh, ha has the interest of the Francophone community at heart. And this government has been extraordinary with Franco-Ontarians. The hospital that was supposed to close down a few years ago under the past government um, raised from its ashes, and we have doubled the number of beds in that hospital. And uh, I will have the pleasure to uh, announce the designation of uh, this hospital as a teaching hospital. I have done my uh, my classes there as a nurse, and I would like to uh, thank the minister for giving me the opportunity to make this announcement. Thank you. Member from the PN Carlton. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. If I may, just before I uh, speak, I want to congratulate all of the new members of this assembly. Obviously, uh, Mr. Fraser from the same city as me, and Doug Holliday uh, to our new bench, and also to the others. It's great to have you here. And my question is to the premier. Premier, you and I have uh, asked and answered, or tried to get answers from you on a num number of occasions, almost 40 direct questions from you on what the true cost of those cancelled gas plants are, and I haven't been able to get that response from you. But I do know you are in. A, you do have that information because the auditor's report has been given. Given to you in advance. The residents of Nepean Carlton would truly appreciate it once and for all if you would provide us in this assembly with the full details and the true costing of what those cancelled gas plants are. You've had all summer to do it. Will you do it today? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know my colleagues will want to comment in the supplementary. I do not have the auditor's report, Mr. Speaker. I do not know what the auditor's report is going to say, Mr. Speaker. And when the auditor's report is available, it will become public, Mr. Speaker. We were promised it before we came back, Speaker, and I want to go back to the Premier. I have no interest in hearing the spin lines from the government House Leader. The abuse of tax dollars to what could be to the tune of $1 billion that has been misspent is a serious matter. That is why our Leader is calling for a judicial inquiry so justice will be served and the severity of this matter will be studied in the full view and the full attention of the public. Premier, we need a full inquiry now, but we also need the full set of numbers. We need know that you have them. We know that you've had them for quite some time. Will you make that known to us today? I appeal to you on behalf of all Ontarians, and in particular the residents of Nepean Carleton. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I will say to the member opposite that just repeating an untrue statement does not make it true. I do not have the numbers. I do not have the Auditor General's report. When I have the Auditor General's report, it will be shared with you. I do not have those numbers. And Mr. Speaker, I asked the Auditor General to look at the two situations. I went to committee and answered questions, Mr. Speaker, and I opened up the I opened up the scope of the committee so that those questions could be asked, Mr. Speaker. I repeat, Mr. Speaker, I do not have the Auditor General's report. I have not seen it. I do not have those numbers, and when they are available, the member opposite will be able to see them. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Uh, I've been challenged a few times today to try to bring us to focusing on how we should be asking and responding to questions and also what we should be doing in between that time. Uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm challenged by the way you responded uh, by saying it's untrue, true. So let's try to be as succinct as possible with this. I'm. Uh, I'm making, a, I'm making an observation about what I'm hearing. I haven't made a challenge to anyone other than to challenge us to race to the top instead of the bottom. Let's try to keep this on a high level, please. I'm uh, satisfied with that, and I'm just making a comment. Uh, new question, the member from Trinity East Medina. Uh, Speaker, the, uh, the question is to the Premier. The Premier once talked about the need to work uh, with the City of Toronto on transit uh, as part of the conversation that she is fond uh, uh, of saying. So why has she sent the Minister of Transportation to cause chaos and division by announcing a cut-down Scarborough subway plan with no buy-in from City Council, no buy-in from the TTC, or apparently even Metrolinx, the government's own transit planners? For transportation and infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, uh, 
I want to be very clear about this, Mr. Speaker. There has been, if you look at the maps, one way only and one route only between the Kennedy Station and Scarborough Town Centre. It is the route we are proceeding with. It is the route that was there today. It was the route that was there three years ago. It is the route it has never changed. This government has never proposed an alternate route to do that. What we are changing is the technology, Mr. Speaker. The technology is changing from an LRT to a subway. There are a number of the member from Renfrew come to order. There are a number there are a number of members of my caucus, Mr. Uh, Mr. Balkison and uh, uh, Le Berardinetti and Dugan and others who have fought for 20 years to get a subway. Missy Mighty Hunter heart. ran on it, Mr. Speaker. We are paying 100 percent of the cost of that. Not only do we have collaboration with the city, Mr. Dugan and Councillor Thompson are co-chairing a committee to develop and elaborate this project and others going forward, which I think is an unprecedented level of cooperation between our two governments, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the, uh, the Minister's latest plan has been widely panned as half-baked, politically driven, and perhaps even physically impossible. Why is the Minister playing railroad tycoon and taking pod shots at supposed partners instead of working collaboratively, co collaboratively with the City of Toronto to improve transit to Scarborough residents. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I could take a great deal of lessons uh, from some of my friends at City Hall in Ottawa, like Mr. Flaherty and Mr. Ford, on pot shots. I certainly have had a lot from them. The only two points we've made were not pot shots, Mr. Speaker. The two points we've made of our colleagues in the other governments, with, and I don't speak of the whole city, but some politicians there who are champions but not funders. Four percent, Mr. Speaker, is a Canadian as a contribution to the regional as a contribution to our, our economic and social capital of this country's transit needs is laughable, Mr. Speaker. I've been mayor of another city. I would have never accepted less than a third. The mayor of Kitchener doesn't accept less than a third. The mayor of Ottawa doesn't, less, uh, doesn't accept less than a third. And I hope his federal counterparts will start raising this issue. The city, Mr. Speaker, has yet to put five cents into a subway. So, Mr. Speaker, we again find ourselves as the only people funding our promises and delivering our promises. My question, Mr. Speaker, is what route does the NDP want to change the route? Do they not like the route that's been there for four years? What is their position? How are they going to fund this, Mr. Speaker? What did Mr. Giambroni promise the people of scarborough gilbert Mr. Speaker? New question. The member from Glengarry and Prescott Russell. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Our 2013 budget is about creating jobs and helping people in their everyday lives. Speaker, any economist uh, will tell you that an effective regional support program will play a significant role in supporting businesses and communities, helping them grow and create good, meaningful jobs. With Ontario back on track after the global recession, it's still important to provide economic supports to rural regions across this province to ensure economic growth and prosperity. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the minister please update this House about the action our government is taking to provide regional economic development supports for businesses across Ontario and in Glengarry Prescott, Russell, for example? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Glengarry Prescott, Russell, for uh, such an important question. Mr. Speaker, my colleague is correct when he says that Ontario is back on track, so much so that we have recovered over 180 per cent of the jobs that were lost during the recession, more than 475,000 jobs, 90 per cent of those jobs full-time, 80 per cent of those jobs in the private sector, Mr. Speaker. And a lot of that has to do with the commitments made through our Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, the important Eastern Ontario Development Fund, which we have committed almost $90 million of support for so far. And these investments have not only created and retained more than 20,000 jobs. They've leveraged private sector investment of nearly $1 billion, Mr. Speaker, uh, and our government's commitment to promoting such regional economic development remains a priority. In fact, as I mentioned earlier just last week, I was in Elmira and Palmerston and Guelph Answer. investing more than $3 million, $2 million, invest, $3 million Mr. Speaker, of investments, uh, creating uh, a considerable number of jobs and retaining them as well. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. It's great to hear that our government is working to support businesses across the province and leverage investments for growth, such as in my own riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell, Bose Beer is expanding, and Holder Tractors is expanding as well. Speaker, while providing these supports is important, rural Ontario communities face unique challenges when it comes to employment. For example, what may work in Toronto here does not necessarily work for the rest of rural Ontario or for other rural ridings across this great province. I recognize the importance of helping people find good jobs in their home communities. This will help keep Ontario diverse while contributing to the lives of those who may not live in major urban areas. Speaker, through you again to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, could the minister please update this House on what our government Question. is doing to help everyday Ontarians in all regions of Ontario find good quality jobs? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is, in fact, a great opportunity to let the legislature know about our government's recent expansion of the boundaries for our regional economic development funds and how this will further help to create jobs in local communities across the province. The Southwestern Ontario Development Fund will now include the County of Simcoe, Mr. Speaker, and the Eastern Ontario Development Fund will now include the District of Muskoka. And I have to say, I want to congratulate the local, municipal, and regional leaders of those of those two areas for working uh, so diligently and closely with my ministry to make that possible uh, by expanding these geographic boundaries. Mr. Speaker, we're helping businesses, not-for-profit organizations and municipalities in both Simcoe and Muskoka to apply for funding for projects that will spur innovation, attract investment and create good local jobs. Growing up, of course, as I did in rural Ontario, Mr. Speaker, I understand just how important regional economic development programs are and economic Answer. development generally for rural Ontario, and I'm sure my colleague feels the same for his constituents. Thank you. No question. The member from the member from uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, it's been two years since your government's self-serving decision to cancel the Mississauga gas plant in the dying days of the 2011 election. And for two years, your party has done its best to obstruct, delay, and avoid coming clean with the taxpayers about how much this is going to cost them. Despite being under oath, one Liberal operative, operative after another, when called in front of the committee, has put on their best Sergeant Schultz impression. That's so true. When you appeared before the same committee, you also refused to answer a question put to you 32 times. The committee's summer hearings left us with a whole lot more questions, not answers. You're on the record as saying that you want the answers to come out and that you have heard the public's anger loud Question. and clear. Will you finally let us get to the bottom of this scandal, end this charade, and call a judicial inquiry? Thank you. Come here. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we certainly appreciate the question. I recall in the month of April uh, at the Justice Committee, uh, the uh, CEO of the Ontario Power Authority was a witness. Uh, and at that particular meeting, uh, he presented uh, his best cut at the cost of Oakville. We also had a number put forward by the uh, opposition critic as his best cut for the cost. There was also an independent consultant who put his number forward of the best, uh, be best cut at the cost of that particular project. Three weeks earlier, the CEO of the OPA had given a different cost for that project. Mm -hmm. If there was no other evidence, Mr. Speaker, that we need the Auditor General to report and to have the patience to wait for her and that office, that's where it should be, that's where the answer will come, and it won't come answer. from one committee meeting where four people are giving four different answers, Mr. Speaker. They're wasting time at the committee. We want to get on with the business of this legislature. Let the Auditor General do his job. Thank you. Supplementary. A lot of bluster, a lot of excuses, no answers. Premier, the obstructionist tactics by Liberal Party operatives are well established. They have memory lapses. They claim that sworn testimony by other witnesses in front of the committee is false. They dispute unequivocal evidence contained in the release documents. You claim you want to have the question answered, questions answered, but your actions betray your true intentions. 
It is clear that your Liberal government has no interest in the truth. Your attempts to pay lip service to transparency have been exposed, and nobody believes you anymore. No way. The only way to restore public confidence and get to the bottom of this Question. is to call a judicial inquiry. Why won't you do this? What are you hiding? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, there's a statement here, and uh, the question is, who said this? The cost of a public inquiry is excessive. We don't believe that that's necessary. Well, that's from MPP Leone, MPP for Cambridge. Oh, Dr. Okay. Leone. So what's changed between then and now, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I can only repeat that the Justice Committee has gone up right? and down on this issue a hundred times. They've got different answers. We had the Premier had the leadership capacity to say, let the Auditor General look into it, let the Auditor General come back and report. We did it for Mississauga. We accepted the report. We're doing it for uh, Oakville. We'll accept the report. Answer. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, last uh, week, the Premier skipped around the North on a whistle-stop tour, but her government isn't going anywhere on issues that actually matter to Northerners. She hasn't delivered on the twice-promised, twice-cancelled conversion of the Thunder Bay Generating Station. And in fact, Northerners have watched as the Liberal government blew over half a billion dollars cancelling gas plants in southern Ontario, and they blew 20 million cancelling the Thunder Bay gas plant conversion twice. Now, Northerners are asking themselves what's going on here. They need results and they don't need photo ops and endless conversations. My question is a pretty basic one, Speaker. When can the people of the Northwest expect some clear answers about their energy future? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I have to say that my experience of uh, being in the Northwest was that people were pretty darn happy about the uh, experimental lakes area, Mr. Speaker, that the provincial government has stepped up and the federal government advocated its responsibility, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, I have to say, $100 million a year for roads and bridges, Mr. Speaker, that kind of infrastructure investment, that was a direct request that came from municipal leaders, many of them in the Northwest. So, Mr. Speaker, what I have to say is that I did spend time in the North. I did travel the province this summer, and the result of that travel, Mr. Speaker, my travel in the past and in this summer, is that the, the needs and concerns of regions in the, in the province, Mr. Speaker, make their way to our policy discussions, and that results in better outcomes for the people of the province. So I was happy to be there, and I'm happy to, be go to go again. I should correct my record. Oh. On August the uh, 14th, the member from Simcoe Gray provided me with written notice of his intention to raise a point of privilege upon resumption of the House. I am now prepared to give my ruling without hearing further from the member of Simcoe Gray as Standing Order 21D permits me to do so. The member's point of privilege relates to the existence of certain emails that were recently produced to the Standing Committee of Justice Policy in connection with that committee's review of the gas plants issue generally and my September the 13th, 2012 ruling specifically. These emails chronicle a discussion among a number of then current and former staff of Premier McGuinty's office and are offered by the member of Simcoe Gray as evidence that an attempt was made to influence or intimidate me with respect to my ruling arising from the point of privilege put forward on August the 27th, 2012 by the member from Cambridge. As I have said in a public statement on July 30th, I cannot speak to the mindset or the motivation of the authors of these emails. However, I think it is critical to note that my ruling of a prima facie case of privilege had been established by the member of Cambridge was made on September the 13th, 2012, fully eight days before the emails in question here. I can tell the House that I made the September the 13th ruling without any interference from any person based on the evidence and arguments put forward to me by various members of this Assembly based on the August the 27th, 2012 report of the Estimates Committee and in consultation with only my procedural advisors at the table. At no time did any person seek to pressure me with respect to that ruling. And it having been made, it was not changeable in any event. This simply was not possible. As I also noted in my July 30th public statement, 
I meet and have discussions regularly on a wide variety of issues related to my duties and responsibilities as Speaker. I am sure all members can appreciate the extreme reluctance I would have in divulging the topic or content of any of those discussions, for many of them take place with you and your colleagues. To do so would just justifiably open me up to a criticism that I cannot be trusted to keep confidences, regardless of whether they are of great or minor importance. However, given the serious nature of the matter at hand and in what I judge to be in the best interest of this institution, I am prepared to say that at no time in any discussion I might have had after delivering my September the 13th ruling was I the recipient of any inappropriate overture or suggestion. I have not been pressured, intimidated, cajoled, warned or threatened in any way, nor was any influence exerted upon me to do so or say any particular thing or to pursue any particular course of action. Nothing of this nature has taken place. It is because I can so clearly give this House this assurance that I must find that a prima facie case of privilege does not exist. I thank the member from Simcoe Gray for providing me with the comprehensive notice in this matter. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke on a point of order. Today, in the answer given to the member from Nipissing, the government House Leader del delved into areas that I believe are inappropriate for this House to even be considering. And I look at Standing Order 23H, I and M as my justification for raising this point of order. The question at hand, uh, to the, put to the, to the Premier at the time and answered by the, the government House Leader, is to deal with the issue of the gas plant cancellation, matters that were dealt with by this legislature, by this government, by the Liberal Party. For this House Leader to uh, go down the road of trying to make a mockery of what we do in this House by talking about FOIs to the City of North Bay to look for emails that go back years from someone who is no longer a member of that City Council, not let alone the Mayor, uh, and to bring the, raise those issues into this House break, takes us down an area that we are not responsible for. It is, this is not the job of the Legislature of Ontario to be looking for emails from the City of North Bay. Secondly, it is absolutely certain that any emails from the City of North Bay would have nothing to do with the cancellation of gas plants in Mississauga or Oakville. Here, here. And that is an insult to the members of this legislature. It is an insult to the public, the people of the province of Ontario, to play those kinds of games. And I would hope that any question of that nature in the future that is, that is responded to in that silly, ridiculous way by the government House Leader is immediately ruled out of order. I thank the member for his uh, point of order, um, and I honestly believe that it actually would be helpful to this House if all members would refrain from making any personal comments to anyone about anything they've done in the past, present or future. I would also suggest very strongly that all members give serious consideration to uh, speaking to the chair, the speaker, uh, when responding to and asking questions that would help us remove ourselves from the uh, noted uh, comments from the member from Renfrew, Pembroke and Nipissing, and I thank him for his comments, and I charge all of us with taking that path as much and often as possible. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.